Hi, HRN listeners. We're celebrating our 15th anniversary, and we have a really fun campaign and an ask for you. This 15th anniversary tour is aiming to bring you closer to unique food and music experiences in some of the most exciting cities in America. All the while, we're raising funds to support our work empowering the next generation of food system storytellers through our fellowship programs. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and be entered into a raffle in the city of your choice to win a dinner for two at a noteworthy restaurant and tickets for two to a concert at a prominent local venue. We have incredible partners in New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Asheville, and Ardmore, Pennsylvania, who have donated a meal for two and two tickets to a concert of the winner's choice. And all donations help fund our fellowship programs, where we're helping to build essential workforce readiness skills and food system storytelling skills. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. HRN is food radio supported by you. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by Somerset County Tourism. Learn more about New Jersey's Sip and See Craft Beverage Trail at visitsomersetnj.org. We're going to start by introducing everyone. And we'll tell you a little bit about why we're here. I mean, you guys know why we're here, right? This is Flounder Brewery. So let's start with Jeremy to say a few words about yourself. Yes, my name is Jeremy, and I'm uh, one of the owners of Flounder Brewing, along with my cousin Billy and my brother Dan. And uh, we're sitting here right in our new barn. Hi, I'm Cam Winkelstein, uh, owner, head distiller of uh, Belmara Distillery. It was a long drive from right next door. Um, <laughs> yep. And I'm Melanie Morano. I'm your Somerset County Commissioner. All right. So, you know, in the world of craft beverage, the number one thing to me and why we've been doing this for so long is local. And, and, and local means a lot of things. But uh, I love campaigns like this. When, when I'm really interested in going on overnight trips to places like Somerset County. And uh, this new Sip and See Passport is really great. So I know, Melanie, just give us a quick intro to what Sip and See is. And what do I have to do to get the T-shirt at the end? Oh, that's the best part because we have the new long sleeve T-shirt for the fall edition. So every season we issue the Sip and See Passport. It highlights our craft beverage makers here in Somerset County. And most importantly, the C part shows you what you can do while you're sipping here in Somerset County. Spend a weekend, spend a week spend time at our craft uh, beverage makers, but most importantly, see our fabulous natural sites, sporting events, stay in our hotels and visit our fantastic restaurants. So I, I can like tour the canal region. I can come look at Dutch barns. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Canals. You could do one of my favorite things, bird watching. The Audubon Society has a location in North County. There's the DNR Canal, over 30 miles of uninterrupted trail. You don't have to worry about stopping at stoplights. You can just get on your bike and go. But hey, that takes like a couple of days. So spend a couple of nights here. And while you're on the canal, stop at one of our craft beverage makers for you know, a little refreshment along the path. You know, when you're in New York City, there, there's always that next new place that people go. It used to be the East End of Long Island, and then it was the Catskills. And I have to tell you that visiting Somerset County has really opened my eyes up. So thanks for having me out here today. Thank you for yeah. coming. You're always welcome here, Jimmy. So a big part of the Sip and See, and, and while we're actually here, I want to talk first with Jeremy of, of Founder Brewing, because uh, Jeremy, why don't you grab that mic? Uh, Jeremy came in the city about six years ago when he was just getting started. And we did an episode of the best of New York versus the best of New Jersey. And I have to tell you, frankly, back then, we had a hard time coming up with New Jersey breweries. So re re remember those times. Just tell us how you got started. And our listeners may not know that, that you, you started with a little garage brewery. Yeah, we actually uh, start. We opened commercially in 2013. We were licensed in 2011, and we we're only license number 17 in New Jersey. And now there's 141 licenses in New Jersey. And uh, we first started brewing 31 gallons at a time over in an industrial park right around the corner from this beautiful site we're at now. Um, so we were a one-barrel brew house. Eventually grew to a three-barrel brew house and just persisted. 
and persisted. And now we're sitting in 250 year old renovated barns with a 15 barrel brew house um, and one of the busiest tap rooms that the state has to offer nowadays. So, well, I'll tell you this when we toured your brewery earlier, um, I can't believe at, at the, the skill and, and the, the level of quality that, that you're, that you're going for. I mean, tell us about your lagering program. I mean, th th this is world-class beer right here. Well, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, especially what, what makes it unique too, is that we're, we're trying to make the best beers that we can high, highest quality of beers that we can, but we're also doing it in these renovated buildings, which gives us unique challenges, but it's also fun. And in terms of doing the lagering, um, what was great is we have a great head brewer, Doug. Um, he comes up with all of our recipes now, does all of our brewing now. Um, and we wanted to give him the tools to really go and create some new, new good beers, new styles, old school styles. Um, so we have two devoted lagering tanks back there that only make about four to six beers a year. Um, we turn them very slowly to just give time, temperature, and let the beer do its work. And uh, there's some incredible beers coming out of there. Oh, that's great. Well, let's talk to Cam. So th this is such a special place, man. It's like there's an old barn, there's a brewery, and next door there's a distillery. Yeah, it's actually been a great pairing. Um, and uh, the fact that uh, Flounder Brewing was, was moving here was actually a big decision point on my end uh, when I was looking for a place to locate Belmara. Um, is we're looking for a place that both had great ambiance, uh, great community, um, and Carriage Farm here really hit the bill on all of it. Um, we got very lucky uh, with the Clericos. They believed in us early because this is our brand new startup, um, and we just opened uh, December of last year. So, so tell us about this farm. So this is a farm property that we're on. It is, yes. Yeah. So the, the farm property here has been developed over a whole, a whole long time from when it used to be a working farm all the way to some offices and now with uh, more kind of customer-facing excitement happening um, but it still is very much a farm and you can see that just by walking around the property there's animals now on three sides of different types so it really does have that feel while still bringing kind of the uh the new and exciting things to do what kind of animals so uh right now I'm a city there's a guy i don't know about <laughs> animals right right so animals are those things you might have heard of or read about in books um they're out here in the country um but there's uh there's some goats on site now there's sheep and now uh some horses and cows as well so a good mix here for the farm. Well, well you know, Cam, you're, you're very modest. Um, we got a tour also of your distillery just next door. What's the name of your distillery and how did you get started? I mean, you, you, you've got a custom equipment. You've had training that not every distiller has. So to your own horn. Come on. Yeah. So it's, it's been a long process. So I was in the, and was in the Navy for seven years. He's way so too modest. A, ah, thank you. Um, so a submarine officer in the Navy for seven years. And, uh, as that time was coming to an end, I was looking at getting into craft beverage and opening my own business. Um, at the time, I was actually looking for uh, potentially like production assistant jobs in breweries around this area. And I actually saw Flounder back when they were, you know, at that 31 gallons and uh, finally found a picture of their system online. I'm like, yeah, Wait, no, Jeremy, how big was they're that not hiring. Uh, it's about this big and that's only about an inch between my fingers I'm showing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, oh, look, a brewery. I'll bet they have a job. And I saw the tiny little buckets they were using. I said, nope, that, nope that's a family thing. Uh, so I didn't even bother reaching out back then. Um, so the small buckets weren't big enough for you? Uh, I think it was they were already big enough to hold the folks who were working there. I think that's the important part. Um, but yeah, so instead, I actually uh, went overseas. Wait, Jeremy, did he actually come and ask for a job? No, no, he actually never did because I think he saw that we were way too small and probably realized that we were losing money ourselves and that we had nobody to pay. All right. Right. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. Um, so uh, instead, I actually went overseas to uh, Scotland and I did a, um, a master's program at Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh. Um, in, uh, so it was a master's of science in brewing and distilling. So it's one of those things where if you can't work in the industry, you might as well get educated before you jump in because you should know something when you open one of these. Um, and while I was over there, the, the distilling idea kind of took hold and took over. Um, and by the time I left, so all my business plans had switched over to craft distillery and specifically focusing on single malt. Um, so you know, go over there, learn from the best and kind of bring that malt processing here. So when we finally found this site and opened Belmar Distillery, the focus is on single malt. So we're a single malt distillery, every single one of our products made from malted barley. Um, and we're really showcasing the versatility that's in that grain beyond just whiskey. We can use it for really our entire range. You know, one thing great about visiting a brewery or a distillery is you really get to see things up close. And when I walked into Belmar, the first thing I, I did was I smelled the grain. Has anyone been in Belmar distillery, you know, and there are these each batch. What is this? It's like single batch grain. I mean, and you're on a farm. I mean, this is how great whiskey is made. Yeah, I, I feel like if you're not starting with grain in your hands, you're, you're kind of doing it wrong. 
Um, so if you're trying to make a new different product, uh, you really should control the entire production process. So, I mean, starting with the grain is critical and we've been playing with now I mean, a whole different uh, range of base malts for different flavor com com combinations, smoke content, um, really to kind of figure out what is going to work best for us long term. Yeah. Well, now, Melanie, Melanie, when, when you guys tell us about putting together the sip and see passport and I didn't realize you had such amazing resources in Somerset County in terms of brewers and distillers. So tell us the full range of all the craft beverages in Somerset County. Well, you've heard from our brewer, one of our brewers. You've heard from one of our craft uh, distilleries. But we also have a cidery in North County as well, which makes terrific cider. Uh, our North County area has the Sherman Hoffman Bird Sanctuary, part of the Audubon Society. You like that. I do. I keep throwing that in. Um, but you also have some great neighborhoods and towns with fabulous restaurants to visit and stop in and have a little something to eat while you're visiting all of our craft beverage makers. You know, it's fun uh, comparing this to the Catskills or, or another, you know, day trip. I love overnight trips. I, I, I like two night trips. Um, what, what's the strategy for tourism? Because, I mean, if I'm in Philly or I'm, I'm in New York City or I'm in North Jersey, I mean, th this is paradise. We, we drove here when we came, our, our Heritage Radio Network crew, we were driving down the road and it was like the trees formed a canopy over the road. And well, I was like, where was my horse and, and buddy? Come on. <laughs> well, speaking of horses, we have horse trails in our North County. So just come on down with your horse as well. Uh, our Lord Sterling Park is being all renovated now and it accommodates horses. So bring your horses down as well. But yeah, Somerset County has it all. We've got fabulous historical resources too. We are the crossroads of the crossroads of the revolution. We had General Washington did not one, but two winter encampments in Somerset County. Our five generals houses here are landmark places. You know, we finished the Revolutionary War with the signing of the documents right at Rockingham and Franklin down the street from here at Flounder Brewery. So making your plans to celebrate the 250th anniversary of our country, come to Somerset. We've got it all. Wow, that's a great selling point. So Jeremy, what are you going to do for the 250th anniversary of the United States? And when is that? <laughs> what year is that? Who knows what year that is? 2026, all right. We should have planned a little bit better and o opened in our 250-year-old barn at the 250-year-old anniversary. Um, but that, like she mentioned, there's a lot of history in this area and stuff, and we, we have connections with a lot of uh, the, the historians around the area. And what's cool about this type of place that we've created here at Flounder Brewing is to go into some sort of an anniversary like that, a birthday like that. But, you know, I picture on this beautiful piece of property reenactments – old soldiers coming in and coming to the old barn to get tavern beer. And like, it just lends to being able to create kind of really cool one-off events in a space like this. So this is an old barn. I'm looking at these beams and it's like, what are those marks from axes? Those are the marriage marks. So they believe that these huge beams that hold up our second floor and basically the rest of the barn, they believe they're, and when I say they, barn historians have been here, um, 250 years old, but they believe they were moved at one point. So those were the scratch marks put in so that they can realign all the joints. Um, and then even if you go and order a beer on one of our flight paddles, we number the flight paddle using marriage marks like that to just kind of tie it all together. So. You know, when you make beer, I mean, you're aware of the history. Are, are there any stories or inspirations that, that you have in, in, in your beers here? I mean, we're, we're drinking, I was drinking Oktoberfest. What, what's the first beer that you put out for us? Uh, the first one we had over here was actually our flagship. It was an old homebrew recipe called Hill Street Honey Blondale. Uh, the name came from, I first started homebrewing on Hill Street up in a town called Morristown. The honey aspect came from that my grandfather was a beekeeper. And I always wanted to make a beer that you actually tasted the nuances of the honey, not like the old honey brown where it just kind of sweetened it up or gave you more alcohol. This is more about getting floral characteristics uh, from the honey. We use orange blossoms, so you get a little citrus character from it. Um, but just wanted to make a good all-around, well-rounded craft beer that can appease to the masses, but also show them the nuances a beer can have. And that's really, and this is our top seller now. This is what drives our sales. It's just a good blonde ale. Who's drinking the Hill Street right now? Anybody? They're all good. They're busy. This is actually <laughs> awesome. We're recording a radio show. This is HeritageRadioNetwork.org. You can subscribe, become a member, check out the website. If you guys know Spotify, 
Apple, Stitcher, all the podcasts are on there. And we've been doing shows for almost 14 years weekly. And there's a chef show, a cocktail show, many other farm and uh, social issue shows too. So cheers to heritageradionetwork.org. And thanks for, thanks for bringing us out today, Melanie, and the, the Sip and See program. Thank you to Somerset County Tourism for supporting this episode of Beer Sessions Radio. The vibrant community of Somerset County is considered the heart of New Jersey, and for plenty of meaningful reasons. Whether you've come to play, work, or stay, expect to fall in love with their proud history and heritage, eclectic culture, and exceptional quality of life. This fall, sip and see your way around and visit five of the region's craft beverage destinations. From brewers, cideries, to distilleries, enjoy a spectacular journey through the wonders they offer. All of them uniquely Somerset. Learn more about the Sip and See Passport Program, choose your starting location, and even earn a prize at visitsomersetnj.org. That's visit, S-O-M-E-R-S-E-T-N-J dot org. So, uh, Cam, you know, I'm, I'm visiting this little slice of Hillsborough, and I like it. And I didn't know that the brewery and distillery were next door to each other, <laughs> Separate and kind of equal. Um, you, you, we, we did a pre-show interview, and, and I said, Cam, what's your favorite drink? And he says, well, at home, it's whiskey. But at Belmara, it's... It's definitely our Belmara Negroni. Negroni. So I had a Negroni before the show, just so you know. So what's in it? So everything in there you guys made. And, and tell us that process, because I see, I see you take the grain, and you're making spirits. How does that become a Negroni? Yeah, so the as I, as I mentioned before, everything is from malted barley. So it is all single malt spirits. Um, so the Negroni itself showcases really what the, we can do with those malt-based spirits. Um, Negroni is a great drink because it's got three alcoholic components. Um, here in New Jersey, craft distilleries can only serve alcohol that we actually make. So whereas in a traditional Negroni, you have a sweet vermouth, a Campari, and a gin, we can't sell vermouth and we can't sell Campari. So we had to come up with our own corollaries to those. Um, so what we use is we use our single malt spirit and we then infuse it um, with, well, for the, uh, what we call our uh, digestif, with the, which is our sweet vermouth equivalent. It's got 18 different botanicals and fruits in it to kind of get the same flavor profile and mouthfeel that you would get out of a vermouth. Um, for the Campari, we have a hibiscus aperitivo which again, it's got, it's, I think that one's got more like 32 different botanicals in it to just kind of hit that complexity that you would get out of a uh, drinking bitters. Um, so that Negroni, one of the reasons I love it, first, it's delicious, um, but it also really showcases the versatility of both what we can do in our cocktail bar and where you can go with malt-based spirits because it's just not something that's done all that often. So if I came in and I wanted a tequila at Belmara, what would you tell me? I, I'd probably tell you to go down the road to the nearest bar and, and get that. <laughs> But what could I have instead? Um, but instead, uh, so our single malt spirit, which is uh, a really good, pure expression of what malt spirits are. Um, it's double distilled. It's lightly carbon filtered. Um, and it retains a whole lot of malt character and some fruit aromas from the fermentation. Um, that actually drinks fairly flavorful. So it, it can drink like a tequila or even like a white rum. So I would recommend that instead. And it works very well. That's great. So, Jeremy, just tell us more about the relationship. I mean, you're a distillery next to a brewery. Maybe tell us a couple stories about when you guys were, you were opening here. Did you open first? Did Cam follow? You know, this, this is probably one of the most special places I've been in, in the whole New Jersey area. So congratulations. Thank Jeff, you. Let's make a toast to uh, Belmar Distillery and Flounder Brewing. And Sip and See. Cheers. All right, everybody. Well, for the record, we're first. <laughs> um but yeah, we're actually pretty well ahead on our development project with the owners of the property at the time, name he mentioned before, the Clericos. Um, and they let me know that they are contacted by somebody who wanted to do a startup distillery. And to me, those two worlds, brewery and distillery, are extremely complementing businesses, especially in a unique location like this. So it immediately 
helped this become a destination to have a great experience, whether it's the beer atmosphere we've got going in here in the old barns or the great, fantastic kind of experience you can have in there with these incredible cocktails that are created there. It's, it's complementary to each other. You can have two completely different experiences all within a 10 foot walk from each other. Um, so we're excited when they finally open in December and especially as that nice season came in the spring and people are coming out and we're all outdoors and everything again, COVID had just started to come down. Um, it, 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 it was, it was proven point and, and it's just become a great destination for people coming here. Jeremy, like about six years ago, we met, you came into New York, we did a show. Um, what was it like back then for you? I mean, you, you said you came in with a six stole, you had the little, I don't know, the 31 inch gallon system. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, an I love it. And a big part of brewing is still the, the home brewers starting out and just how important it is using good ingredients. It was, and, and, and from a personal perspective, what that was, what was really cool about that, that appearance, and it was at the green space, which is a really cool experience, was this was right at the point in time when I had left my job to now do this full time and try to grow my business and then to get an invite to bring one of my beers in to a show that I've listened to for a long time. And I've known a lot of people that also do know you and who have been on the show. And I'm like, oh, Jimmy Carboni is on the show. Like Flounder is brewing is here today. Come hey, on. maybe I made the right decision to quit my job. It was still five more years before we <laughs> opened this. Um, but it was just a really cool experience. And especially because we were with some other great New Jersey brewers. And that whole craft and craft beverage community now is still just a great community. And I think that's also what comes through when people come and experience these places is you're also getting the experience that it's just for the majority of us, this is people doing what they love and they want to extend that feeling they have to everybody coming in there. Um, so it, all of us together on the radio show, then us now having our livelihoods here right next to each other. It, we want to always portray how we love what we do onto everybody coming in the door. You know, b before I came, uh, Brad from uh, Discover Central Jersey uh, gave us a nice tour and we, and we saw some of the canals and we talked about biking around here or, or, or even walking on the trails. But I, I definitely got really thirsty. <laughs> so I, I was happy to come over to your brewery. But just to tell our listeners, like, describe this barn. I mean, this is such a special place. Doors are open on both sides. I'm seeing, I guess, on one side there's a sunset. Um, just tell us, what, what, what does it feel like being in this historical barn as your business? I mean, this is a fantasy. Oh, I, I love it. I, I love being here. I love hanging out here. I love working here. Um, but it is a, it's, a, it's a pretty big barn. And, and on the left and right side, we call it the north and the south. We have these enormous glass garage doors that just swing open. They were the original openings to the barn that they would pull the horse carriages through that had the, the hay on it to pull up to the hay lofts. We do have a nice loft above us now that we have private parties utilized. 49 people can be up there. We have 21 picnic tables outside split between those two big barn openings. So it was all about on a beautiful night like tonight with this, what's going to be a great sunset over there, um, is just it's connects inside and outside. It's open. We wanted, even though we had to do a lot of work to this to bring it up to modern code and everything, we still wanted you to come in and feel like you were drinking in a barn. And you're on the farm and you can see the you can see the livestock right out that garage, the south garage door. Um, we wanted that connection and just that feeling. And wow. Now, M Melanie, um, again, I've been out here before. I didn't realize that this is where the canals were. You know, I've been to Manning. I, I, I've been to Lambertville, this whole area. What did the canals mean to, to this region? And then how does that tie into tourism? Well, the canals go back when the the horses were pulling those barges to get product to New York City and to northern New Jersey. So there's that historical component to those canals as well. But the canals bring people to different venues. They are a source of recreation. They are a source of environmental protection. They are a source of transportation. A lot of people use those canals to bike, to get back and forth to work or school or wherever they're going. So the canals are vital to our area. That's great. It's really a special place. I know this place. I've been here. I love the canals. And um, it's not too far from New York. Tell us where we are, because even driving here, some of our New York friends weren't, weren't sure wh where we were. You are a short ride from New York City. I commuted to New York City for 12 years from my house. So you are a day trip away. But I think there's so much here. We really encourage you to spend the weekend so you can really experience Somerset County. Uh, we are probably about 35, 40 miles from New York City. 
where we are here, you can take the New Jersey Transit line using the Raritan Valley line to get right here to downtown Raritan or Somerville, uh, Bound Brook, and you can stay at any of those locations and you're a short ride from Hills to Hillsboro and Clerical Farms. Great. Now back to Cam. So one thing I love about the craft beverage in- industry is just the the diversity of talent and, and backgrounds. I mean, you, you were in the Navy and submarines. Tell us about that, because it looks like your, your distillery looks like a submarine. <laughs> yeah, I, I've, been, I've been told that before. He's kind of recreate what you came from. Um, you know, there's nothing more complex than operating a nuclear reactor way down deep underwater. Uh, so all the pipe work and steam and everything I'm dealing with now in distilling is easy in comparison. Uh, but it did give me an opportunity because I was, I was an officer back then. They didn't let me touch power tools. So I actually had to open my own business to, to be able to actually play those fun games. Um, but uh, no, I mean, being in the Navy was great. It was uh, one of the best parts of my life so far. Uh, learned a lot. Great people. The submarine community is very tight. Um, and uh, the only thing more regulated, uh, you know, than uh, alcohol here in the U.S. is nuclear power. So you know, dealing, dealing with the, so it's easy. So <laughs> it's easy. <laughs> you, you showed me, I mean, I know that with distilling, you know, com- dis- comparing distilling to brewing, distilling, you've got some other issues like these fire codes. Tell me how you had, how, just tell us what that is. Cause you mentioned an 80 page paper you had to write. Yeah, I, I definitely, I wrote it. I'm not actually sure anybody read it, um, <laughs> but it made me feel better going through the process uh, to have written So because it. they knew you worked on nuclear submarines, you wrote the 80 page paper they stamped it and whenever whenever you walk into a meeting and slam a giant notebook on the table uh people will assume that you actually did a little bit of research um so that that definitely helped but no the the alcohol is a uh you know it's a flammable liquid so it's just different building a distillery just because you have to take all those safety features into account um so whereas i mean the the nice thing about brewing is you can put it almost anywhere uh without too many of those kind of safety related issues Distilleries can only be in specific places, specific types of buildings. Um, you know, d- distilleries are regulated under the same codes that uh, oil refineries are. So we're, we're fighting a pretty uphill battle, especially at this scale. Um, but luckily, I mean, the township here at Hillsborough was great working with us, getting all the approvals. I mean, it's, uh, it's not something that every town is willing to do. And Hillsborough, they, they worked with us, especially through COVID. Uh, they really gave us a, a, good, a good look here, and we were able to open it up fairly efficiently. Great. And let's talk about fun stuff. So I, I've been to Belmar Distil, Distillery. I've been to Flounder Brewing. What are, what's your favorite thing to do in Somerset County when you have a day off? Yeah, it's a tough one there because the day off part. Um, no day off. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the distillery, you know, the tasting room's open Wednesday through Sunday. The production side's working Monday through Friday. you take your afternoon Friday. break before you have your drink. I usually come over here to Flounder oh. Brewing. <laughs> uh, no, it's actually, here, being here in Somerset is amazing. I mean, my commute uh, jumps right over the canal. Um, I, I pick my daughter up from daycare, and every time we bounce over the canal, it's like, Daddy, I want to stop at the canal, because she wants to throw rocks, like any three-year-old. So, you know, about half the time, we stop for 15, 20 minutes, and I get the joy of watching her throw rocks into the canal, and then we keep going. But the mere fact that we're able to do that in such a beautiful place on our way between where we live and here is amazing. Um, so yeah. we're in Hillsborough. What, what's, there's something called the Duke's Estate or the Duke's Farm. What is it called and what is it? Yeah, Duke, Duke Farm is a, it's a beautiful site. I mean, it's the, the Duke family built it ages ago. They were, you know, big money a long time ago. I'm sure somebody can go into the historical detail much better than me. Um, but what we're left with is just an incredible place to go and walk and experience um, my wife and I have wandered around there quite a lot. I mean, it's just, there's so many different things to do from the butterfly gardens to like the old terraces. Um, they do a maple syrup festival during the winter. Um, it was one of the last events that we went to right before COVID hit. Um, and I'm really glad we did because, you know, it was amazing. I mean, in retrospect, it was probably a super spreader event, but we didn't know that then. So we still had fun. Um, but it's right here. It's very accessible. I mean, there's the farmer market on the weekends. There's just so much to do. Um, it's, it's a really nice way to take what used to be a giant estate, open it to the public for really almost any kind of access. It's amazing how many farms are out here in the open space, you know, let, let, let's talk to Jeremy again, Jeremy, what, what are we drinking? And, uh, what, there, there's so many things I know you want to talk about. I'm talking about your community involvement. I mean, I'm, I'm from the East village in New York city and, 
I'm in the Ukrainian East Village, and I know you've got some Ukrainian blood. That um, is true. What, what's going on this week? So, uh, yes, I'm half Ukrainian. My mom's full Ukrainian. Uh, we've got our third Ukrainian fundraiser coming up, which is actually tomorrow. Um, we bring up a Ukrainian band from Philly. That's incredible. We put out cash donation buckets everywhere. Uh, we make a beer called Putin Julio, which was based off of a recipe from Pravda Brewery in Kiev. Putin Julio. Yeah. <laughs> we, we won't say on the radio what that stands for. Um, this batch we made, we actually made with Ukrainian hops. Can I say Putin Julio? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Is that okay, Matt? <laughs> <laughs> um, and all of the proceeds from the sales of that beer go. So, so far, the uh, fundraisers we had done to date, we've raised $15,000 towards humanitarian aid for Ukraine. So we decided to do it again tomorrow because this actually is our nine-year anniversary weekend from we ever first poured our first commercial beer. Thank you. So we made the Ukrainian fundraiser. Hey, thank you. As the first part of that weekend. Um, so, but going to the community aspect is it was always important for us to create our space, our livelihood that we want to share with everybody else of being a community centric location. It is what makes us a brewery in this state different from a barn or restaurant. Um, you know, they, we're obviously family friendly here. Um, we have a lot of different groups that have their meetings here during the week. We have corporations that have meetings here. We just really want to become a community hub. That's, it's quite amazing. You came a long way from your first place. Thank you. Thanks. You really have. Congratulations. Now, Melanie, um, we're going to keep going for about 45 minutes. If you have questions, uh, just hand them into this crew over here and we'll, we'll read them off. But Melanie, tell us what your job is. Like, it's always <laughs> my favorite thing is what is your job? You work for government. I do. Um, you're always on the road. I, I do. You know everybody. I try to get around the county as much as I can. I love our county so much. It has so much to offer. In fact, speaking of the Ukrainian, I don't know if you know that the Ukrainian Cultural Center is located right here in Franklin Township in Somerset County. It is probably the largest Ukrainian cultural center in the United States. Um, and it's right down the road from one of our other craft distilleries, Jersey so Cyclone Brewery. So another great place to come visit for the cultural effects. But yeah, being a county commissioner is fun. We get to meet so many wonderful people and get a chance to see things and take care of our roads and bridges and recycling and boards of health and, and everything else within the county. And when you do a campaign like the sea and sip, I mean, this is insider talk, but we, we can talk that way, right? Um, <laughs> sure. You know, your number one goal is to get people to stay overnight, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. And you could pick up one of our passports at any of our, our beverage uh, creators within the county. And when you get them all stamped, you get a beautiful T-shirt. Well, now we have the long sleeve edition, which is very nice for the fall. But most importantly, within our passport, there are suggestions of places to visit, including Duke Estates that we were just talking about, Ukrainian Cultural Society. Um, let's, oh, my gosh, there's so many. The DNR Canal. I'm definitely coming to Flounder Brewing and Belmar Distilling. I know that. So what, what, what's one more spot we should know about? Yeah, so when you're here in Somerset, if you plan that weekend, which we would love for you to do, we've got so much to do during the day and the night, which we are so proud of our double A affiliate of the Yankees, of the New York Yankees. <laughs> our Somerset Patriots just clinched the AL East of the double A uh, division. So we are so excited for our champs and it's a great place to come in the summer, see some great baseball with future championships for the future champions for the New York Yankees. Wow. You do have a great job, don't you? <laughs> I do. It's so much fun. We get to go to baseball games and yeah. come to breweries and distilleries and meet wonderful people like you. All right. So more questions. You're, what do you do on your day off, Jeremy, or your time between lunch and evening drinking? Uh, I'm kept very busy cause I have 10 year old twins. Um, so it, that, yeah, that it's family time when I'm not here working, whether it's production or we've got special events, it's family time. But what is nice now that they're 10 year old twins, we can bring them here and they can keep themselves entertained. So a lot of times they actually end up here, but beyond that, it's, it's really just family time and travel. We do a lot of vacations and stuff like that when we can and enjoy them while they're, before they're off to college and everything. But you can just come and hang out at the brewery all day. Yeah, also, I go over to the distillery often and have a cocktail. Yeah. He comes here for beer. Cam comes here for beer. I go over there for a, a delicious Belmara mule. So. so back to beer. Let's talk about the Oktoberfest. Yeah, so we just had the Oktoberfest out, which is a nice, darker, Marzen-style lager. 
um, nice caramel notes in there, more of your older traditional kind of Oktoberfest style versus your, your fest beer style. It's called Last Train in Munich. We pull it out once a year. We do one batch a year. This year in our bigger system, we were happy to finally can it. And Saturday is our actual nine year anniversary. So that's our Oktoberfest anniversary party. And this will be the featured beer for that anniversary party. You know, in most breweries I'm at and most bars, the IPA is the number one beer. But you, you've got quite a range of beers. What, what's your philosophy behind your beer program? A, a huge part, I full heartedly believe a brewery's tap room is to be is beer education. We are here to also educate the customer on what beer is there beyond whether it's macro American lagers or the massive New England IPAs. We, we come in and give them a tour of the process, how it's made, answer questions, make sure that it's an educational experience for everybody. That so as a brewery, in. you have, you, what do you have to do? You have to in the, give them a tour or in just the, provide in, information? In the state of New Jersey, we have to have a tour, which is defined as a meaningful interaction with the consumer. We do deal with some pretty ridiculous regulations in the state, and this is one of them, but we don't have to bring people on an actual physical tour because our insurance wouldn't like that. But we use that as the state mandated uh, requirement that we have to tell you about the history of the barn or what's a great beer style you may have never thought you would have liked. So when it goes back to like say the IPA offerings, two to three tops on our menu, we have 20 beers usually on the menus. It, it's a broad range of styles because the beer world is incredible and the offerings that it has. Great. And tell us about your just last thing, your lagering system. It, it looks pretty great. I mean, this walk us through the whole thing for the beer geeks that, that are our core audience. So. Well, on the lagering side, we were excited to pick up uh, two horizontal lagering tanks. Oh, new beer. Salute. This is our lunatic Belgian golden ale, which is just your, yeah, lunatic. This is uh, our brewer Doug's absolute favorite beer to brew. It actually has history where the recipe, most of the recipe originated from a brewery that was here in the early 2000s, well before its time called Heavyweight Brewing, run by a guy named Tom Baker, who opened up Earth Bread and Beer in Philadelphia. I know it. And that this, this something was, hammer. Yes, and then he has... Um, Pecunia's Petunia's Hammer. Uh, I, I had it. I know what you're talking about, and I don't remember it. Um, but this was based off of Tom's Luna, Luna C recipe. And our brewer, Doug, learned under the tutelage of Tom Baker. Um, so Tom let us make a, our own version of, we called it Lunatic. And it's just it's a just a delicious Belgian golden ale. Well, cheers to Tom Baker. That's a, that that's amazing beer history here, man. He's 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 a legend. Yeah. And actually, when we were talking before the show, uh, Cam, this is the beer that you gave a shout out to. Oh yeah, for uh, under process underage whiskey, this one's particularly good. <laughs> so we we know the difference, but we don't really. So how is beer and whiskey related? So, I mean, for especially with the process we use with malt, because, I mean, we talked about the versatility of the beer world. A lot of that versatility comes from the base ingredient, most of which actually is malted barley. So when you see the giant range of beers that are out there, it'll give you an idea of the range of spirits we can do with those same types of malt. So, for example, you know, a, a malt-based beer, if we were to take that and distill it and then put it in a barrel for a while, it would become whiskey. So a little bit of extra processing, a little bit of extra age, just to make an absolutely delicious whiskey. Okay. So how did you describe this again? Uh, an under-processed, under-aged whiskey. <laughs> okay. So should we let nuclear scientists into the building or not? I don't know. Maybe I like, the, I like your distillery. I will say that. Now tell us about your, I mean, it looks like a submarine. Tell us about your custom special equipment. Yeah, so one thing that's not very well known about distilling is the still itself is actually a, a critical ingredient in the final product. Um, so our stills are, we have two custom-made copper pot stills. Um, they were designed by me based on shapes that I encountered in Scotland. So as I toured distilleries during my time over there, I then tasted the whiskey. When I found particular flavor profiles or aspects that I liked, I'd look at the still and be like, hey, that shape makes that whiskey. Maybe I should incorporate some sort of that aspect in when, when we have our stills made. So the two stills we have, um, they actually are, are reminiscent most directly of uh, a space side distillery that I particularly like. Um, and it gives a, a sort of sulfuric aspect to the, the malt spirit. Um, these stills were custom made for us over in Italy. Um, there's not too many companies that are willing to do custom builds for such a small project. And uh, Frilly Stills was great working with, and then 
managed to get them over to us again during COVID in the middle of a shipping crisis. Um, but I did get the joy of putting them together myself, which was wonderful. Uh, but it gave me a chance to use power tools, which I love. All right. And then what, what were some, a, a couple of the details of your custom project? I mean, was it size? What, what were you looking for that you couldn't have just bought off the shelf? Yeah. So in, a, in the U.S., whiskey is dominated by bourbon. Um, most people who are getting into craft distilling and craft whiskey are in the bourbon world. And bourbon is, bourbon is a type of whiskey, and it's defined as being made with 51% corn rather than, you know, we use 100% malted barley. So most bourbons are maybe 70% corn, 20% wheat, and maybe 10% malted barley. Uh, but the bourbon process is different. There Usually there's columns, um, and it's a different type of still where there's plates in it, which effectively make the alcohol a little more pure as it comes out the other end. So whereas we have to do every, everything we make is at least double distilled, in bourbon you can actually do a single pass bourbon, which means it only runs through a distillation system one time. So when I was designing our system and our process, I was trying to bring a lot of the aspects that I really liked about the scotch industry, but also adjust them slightly to work with American malts and a system that I put together to, to hit very particular profiles. So when we were looking at the custom side of it, it was both the, the scale and the sizes to make sure our process flowed well, but also like we have a cone and, uh, and ball shape on both of our stills, which change the way the alcohol interacts with the copper layers. And that actually affects the amount of sulfur that carries through into the end of the process. So the shape of that still is, is very related to the final uh, product. Wow. Okay, we're starting to get some questions, and if you have a question, you can hand it in to Matt over here. This is a good one, and I don't know if uh, the laws in New Jersey prohibit this. It says, a barrel-age collaboration with Belmara used barrels and flounder beer. Is that possible? Yes, it is. Yeah, that, that is. <laughs> uh, he can, once, he knows we're knocking on his door once he starts emptying the barrels he's filled after about a year or so. We're like, hey, Cam, can we get some barrels? And then we will, we will be putting some beers into those barrels. Yeah, so the joy of barrel collaborations is that when, when we dump a whiskey barrel, so everything is critical, and we can't do a collaboration until we have empty barrels, and we won't have empty barrels until we start harvesting our whiskey. And because everything we do is grain to glass, whiskey takes quite a long time to uh, start to harvest. But when we have those empty barrels, luckily Flounder Brewing is just slightly downhill from Belmara, <laughs> so we can just roll them out our back door, and they'll end up in the brewery. I'm sure they'll get filled pretty quickly. But, but for those asking when that'll happen, it's Camp's fault. That's, that, uh, that can't it is yet. absolutely the, the distillery's fault, yes. <laughs> but I, hopefully sometime in the next year or so, we'll start that process. That was a good question. He's right. I'm getting more questions up here. I'll make up a question. So I'm visiting Somerset. This is Somerset County, New Jersey. Now I know where I am. I know Bound Brook. Is Manville in Somerset, yes. Melanie? Yes, okay, name some of the other towns. Okay. Because I've probably been to most of them. Uh, you've got... Bedminster, Bernard's Township, ba um, Bound Brook. You've got, uh, I know we've got the six Bs there. Bet Branch Bird. Call them out. Call them out. Water. Hold on. I got the six Bs. Got Hillsboro, Somerville, Montgomery, Rocky Hill, Manville, Greenbrook, North Plainfield, Wachung, Warren. Um, Mon I said Montgomery. Montgomery. <laughs> I don't forget about Montgomery. I got Hillsboro. I got Hillsboro. Franklin, thank you so much. I was trying to go through my alphabet. I know I got six Bs, Franklin. Millstone, beautiful downtown Millstone. Such a beautiful, lovely little town. So and historic and so unique. Wow. We're going to keep you going. All right. <laughs> when can we expect the Pitmaster smoked beer? Or what is the history of your smoke beers? Actually, are you making smoke beers, Jeremy? That's a good one. We, yeah, what is smoke beer? Really? Smoked beers are beers that are made with the grains. The malted barley has been smoked. So, you know, beech would smoke, apple would smoke, all different range. Uh, traditional German style smoke beers are referred to as Rausch beers. Um, and our brewer, who I've mentioned a few times, Doug, thinks every beer we make should be a smoked beer. Um, and there's some people applauding that, too. I, yeah. I think your Oktoberfest has a hint of smoked there's, there's malt. Probably a little bit. Doug, Doug probably sneaked it in. Um, yeah. We just I, I mentioned earlier to you when we were talking earlier that we had a, a Polish Grudziki on, which is a smoked Polish lager. Um, Pitmaster is a delicious smoked maple beer. 
that we do in the summertime. Wait, so this, that was a, that's a real beer. That is a real so beer. So he's not joking. It's heavily requested. The Pitmaster about. Smoke beer is coming back, or not? It, it, next will, it will absolutely be back. We've just had a hard time keeping up with production. Ah, well, but if, I, I think if anyone else has favorite, what are some of the other favorite beers that that you've had? And if anyone wants to, to shout it out, we can do that. But. White Wedding, what's White Wedding? That is our Belgian wit beer that we bring out every September. It was actually originally made for one of our regular daughter's wedding, and their last name was White. So it was the White Wedding beer, and now apparently every September that we make it, there's always at least one or two weddings that want to buy that beer now for their wedding. So. Wow. All right. So um, this is on a, we're on a farm. So part of Somerset County has a lot of farms. So this is a farm that has a distillery, a brewery, and things like pizza trucks outside, right? <laughs> um, so the question here is about your spent grain. And I assume it's for the brewery, but maybe it's for both of you. We both have spent grain. Yeah. So there, this is a, it's a question, but you, this is a good one. So the, do the goat and sheep like the byproduct grain, and do they get drunk? <laughs> now that means are you giving the spent grain yeah. to animals on the farm? So they're not getting drunk because spent grain doesn't have alcohol in it. But um, the sheep, the goats, the cows that are on the farm now have just recently moved here. And we will be starting a program where the farmer who owns those animals will be using some of our spent grains for the livestock right here. But we also work with two other farms that come and pick up all of our spent grains. We give it out to free to the farmers. It's a lot of grain. It feeds a lot of animals. And... I mean, that's just always a classic brewery distillery relationship with local ag that it's free grade A feed for animals. Um, but it's going to be cool to start feeding it to some animals right here. So on maybe the farm. one day there'll be a Somerset County spent grain sheep's milk camembert <laughs> cheese like I've had. And I've had that in Amsterdam before. So that would be delicious. Yeah, no, there's a lot. And you can also, have, of course, yeah. spent grain big uh, barbecue. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got the, hand, the oh, yeah. hamburgers. You know. We got a couple more questions coming in. We're going to wrap up. But. First, one more time, I want to give a shout out to first the Sip and See Passport by Visit Somerset County. Thank you, guys. And we are um, also Heritage Radio Network out of New York, and uh, we've got a lot of great shows. Sign up at heritageradionetwork.org. Uh, food, beer, cocktails, and many other things. But we're down here in Somerset County, and I'm loving it. I'm not leaving. I'm hanging out. <laughs> Big question tonight is stay at the brewery or go to the distillery? Yeah, I, I'm. This is Jeremy. I'm gonna. I'm gonna head to the distillery when we're done here because we've been drinking beer. All right. And now I'm gonna head over there. Um, honestly, I'm probably gonna go back to the distillery too because I've been drinking <laughs> beer. But, All right. Yeah. There's last question. This is a good one also. But I, a lot of people love your beers, man. I will say that uh, people remember certain beers. It's one of my favorite parts of, of small breweries. Is gosh, that is my favorite beer. When is it coming back? So this is what's the story behind the deciduous mushroom beer? Now, when people say that. I, I don't know if they're they're m making up a name or they're teasing you, but that's a real beer, Deciduous Mushroom Beer. Yes, we make a beer called Deciduous Transformation and is made with mushrooms. Um, we change around what mushrooms are actually going in it, but it's actually a really light-bodied, light-flavored beer, and it is not scientifically, so we can't advertise it this, but it actually is an under-100-calorie beer, and mushrooms tend to lend an earthiness and a body to a beer that actually has less grain in it because we're going for lower sugar content, lower gravity. Um, but we've also made it with mushrooms that we are on a farm. So even though there's mixed use office buildings, there's some livestock, um, there's a mushroom farm. And predominantly the mushrooms are actually grown in the basement of the building on the front of this property. Um, and then they're also grown in a storage container down the road on another piece of the farm. And we've made that mushroom beer with mushrooms that are grown right here on the farm. And it's actually a delicious beer. Me Personally, I don't like mushrooms, but that beer is delicious. It doesn't taste like you're drinking a mushroom. Yeah, this person likes it. I feel like the same person's writing all the questions, but that's okay. You're on the team now. I need a writer. Come on. All right. Well, this is scary. Okay. Does the county commissioner have a favorite flounder beer? Oh, yes. That's easy to answer. Fred is my boyfriend when I'm here. I'm happily married, but when I'm here... Fred is my man. Fred IPA. <laughs> Fred IPA. We got a taste of Fred IPA. Come on. Loving it. So pre-show <laughs> we surveyed. That easy you question. said Fred IPA. <laughs> Cam said, what'd you say, Cam? Uh, the, the lunatic Belgian. And you said Hill Street Honey Blondale. Yeah, I like them all. But I, I actually this this the lunatic 
Now, what is it again? Uh, the, the lunatic Belgian. The lunatic Belgian is really winning me over. Let, let's finish with styles because big part of, of beer are styles. We did Oktoberfest. The lunatic Belgian. Whoa. Belgian beer is one of my favorite styles too, whether I'm a, a distiller or not. So tell us how you first made that and, you know, Okay, I, this, I love it, man. I'm this, drinking that all night. I'm not leaving. I'm staying for the Belgian. This is this is the one that originated from Frank is too. We're staying from Tom Baker at Heavyweight. So that was the origins of it initially. But to be a nice traditional Belgian, it's got to have that little spicy, that little that coriander. I mean, this has coriander added into it. You need that little bit of spiciness in there. Then we actually give this some time. You need it to mature to be overall smooth beer, especially at an eight percent ABV. Um, so just all those things meld together and, and just gives you that real traditional Belgian characteristic you expect. Well, well, you guys have been great. Big shout out. Thank you, Melanie, Cam, and Jeremy for joining me here on Heritage Radio Network. It's a special live show for the Sip and See Passport Program for Somerset County. And how about this? You each give one shout out to someone in the audience or someone that you work for. Before we close out, Melanie, a quick one. You get 30 seconds or less. I got 30 seconds to say thank you to all of the residents and businesses in Somerset County, especially our Somerset County Business Partnership, who was behind our Sip and See campaign, as well as our Somerset County Cultural and Heritage Team. If you're listening to this, come back to Somerset for our weekend journey to the past, October 8th and 9th. All right. Cam? You got, uh, got 10 seconds. 10 seconds, great. Well, first of all, a quick shout out to Ed Clerico over there. Quick wave, Ed. Uh, he believed in me very early on in developing the distillery here, but also to my wonderful wife, Christina, who's currently watching our three-year-old at home, letting me be here doing this. And we're going to stay out late tonight, so all right. Uh, yeah, so that, uh, of course, thank you to the wife and kids. My wife is actually at my kids' um, back-to-school night because that wasn't on the calendar when I booked this so thank you to them uh and then but a big thank you to the crew back there the team members here at Flounder that really work hard to make an experience for everybody to remember when they come here because right. we wouldn't be able to do something this big without a team well, like thanks that. to our team Heritage Radio Network again Joanna and Frank and Matt Patterson our head engineer we've been working together for a long time and we'll be back I'm coming back to Somerset County all right thanks guys Woo. okay Beer Sessions Radio is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network. Food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe.